This is the day in which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repents of evil. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be Glory. to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Amen. And we sing the canticle. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, Proclaim that his name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He the song we, we now chant, sing or speak responsibly, Psalm 43. <clears throat> Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead out, lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We now continue the Old Testament reading. Sometime, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there 
as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bowed his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. 
There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, Are you not yet fifty years, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We now confess our faith in the first parts of the Catechism. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. Amen we doubt but the Lord provides now just imagine you're a Hebrew slave escaping Egypt in the Exodus you fear that your former master will come and take you back into bondage And God's leading you, but he's not leading on the road out of Egypt, instead towards the sea. And then all of a sudden, the Egyptian army is there pursuing you, and your back is against the impassable water. Or imagine you're an Israelite soldier facing off against the Philistines, and every single day, a giant of a man comes out, and he roars a challenge to send your best soldier, and whoever loses the duel, his people will become slaves. And then the next day you see a a mere boy shouting religious slogans armed only with a sling. Accept the challenge on 
your behalf. Or from today's reading, imagine God has promised to give you descendants as uncountable as the stars. That he has promised that through your lineage, the Savior of the world would come. And then he asks you to take your beloved son, your only son, to the mountains of Moriah to sacrifice him. We doubt that the Lord provides. Of course, we've read the stories. We know how they end. We know that the Lord provided an escape by parting the Red Sea. We know that the Lord provided David with victory and he slew Goliath. We know that the Lord provided a ram for the sacrifice. But the people in these stories didn't know how it was going to end, did they? You know, if you or I were one of those Hebrews or one of those Israelite soldiers, wouldn't we probably start to doubt God? Have any of us ever seen the sea part so we can walk on dry ground? No. Have we ever seen a youth overcome a huge and hardened man of war? Salvation seems improbable in those kinds of situations. Near impossible. And so it would be hard not to doubt. And in a way, that's what makes our Old Testament reading, the binding of Isaac, so amazing. Because Abraham actually believed. Now, Abraham's not perfect. He's like you and I. He, he doubts, he falls. Just read his story and all the times he screws up. But here, he actually believes. Now, he doesn't understand how things are going to be okay in the end. But he believed. And so he climbed up that mountain with his son Isaac. Isaac was the child God had promised to give to him and Sarah in their old age. It was through Isaac that all of the covenantal promises were to be fulfilled. And if Isaac died, those promises would die with him. But Abraham knew that God kept his word. He didn't know how it would happen, but he knew, he believed that he and Isaac would come down the mountain. He even tells the servants accompanying them on the trip. In verse 5, he says, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. He believes. And that's remarkable, but even Isaac <laughs> seems to have believed too. I don't know what it is in your native languages, but in our English translation, it calls Isaac a boy, but the Hebrew word can also mean young man. And if you look at kind of the dates of these stories, there's a good chance that Isaac is like 25 years old at the time, whereas his father Abraham is over 100 years old. There's no way Abraham could have forced Isaac up on that altar. Isaac went willingly. He allowed it to happen. He believed. And at the very last moment, right before Abraham brings down the knife, the angel of the Lord stops him. And what happens? The Lord provides. The Lord provides a ram caught by its horns in a thicket as the sacrifice. And that seems pretty improbable, doesn't it? What a coincidence that a ram would just happen to get caught in that thicket on that mountain on that day. What are the odds? But Abraham, believing God's promises, knew something improbable would have to happen. Abraham didn't doubt. He believed that God would provide. If only 
we <laughs> have that faith of Abraham sometimes. Because the truth is you and I, and even Abraham in other points of his story, we doubt God's promises, don't we? Because we doubt the improbable. And I say improbable, something that's not likely to happen, and I don't say we doubt the impossible. Because the truth is we're Christians, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and most of us truly believe that nothing is impossible to the Lord God. And even though we believe nothing is impossible to God, so often we find it unlikely, we find it hard to apply his promises to ourselves. God promises to care for us. In the Lord's Prayer, he would have us call him our Father. He would have us look for all good things from him our daily bread, escape from temptation, forgiveness, all of it, but we doubt. So many of us have been let down before. The world, friends, neighbors at times have neglected us. Even people who should be bound to care for us like our parents fail. And so for some of us, we find it improbable. We find it unlikely that God will care when so many others haven't. And we doubt. God promises to love you. But some of us have seen less real love than we've seen hurt. And what's more, when we truly look at ourselves, when we look at who we are and what we've done, we can feel downright unlovable and unloved. It's amazing. As Christians, we can confess John 3, 16, and we can say and truly believe it when we say, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. And yet somehow we can say that confessing it and believing it's true, but then doubt that he loves us. God promises to forgive our sins. And at times we believe it, thanks be to God. But then we think of how improbable, how unlikely it is for somebody to keep forgiving you when you keep messing up again and again. How improbable it seems to the human mind that God would keep forgiving us for the same sins again and again. Or we have doubts because of that one sin we tell no one about but God because we think it's too horrible. A thing we think is so bad we could never be forgiven. And as Christians, we believe that Christ forgives, that Christ saves sinners. We'll tell other people about that. We will preach it to the world that Christ saves sinners. And yet at the same time, ironically, we will doubt that he has forgiven and saved us. All of these promises seem improbable. They seem unlikely. But thanks be to God, they're true. And God keeps his promises. And yet still we doubt. You know, we doubt. So God provides. We should believe God at what he says. But we don't. What's more, he knows that. And he loves you. And he wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that you are forgiven. So he actually does it, and he provides proof. Our story from the Old Testament, the binding of Isaac, it's a foreshadowing of the cross of Christ. Abraham calls the mountain at the end, he calls it by the name, the Lord will provide. And Moses, who's writing the story, says that even to his day, people say 
On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What will be provided? The sacrifice. The sacrifice that proves that God cares for us. The sacrifice that shows his great love for us. The sacrifice that redeems, ransoms, and saves us from sin. As improbable as it is, as impossible as it may seem, God sent not the only son of Abraham, but God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to not just atone for your sins, but also to be a sign and a pledge of his love for you. An icon to hold before your eyes to strengthen you when you doubt. Does God care for you? Does he? Look at the price he paid for you. He loves you so much that he ransomed you with the death of his own son. Maybe you've been let down in the past. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a God who is willing to die for you so that he can have you for eternity, so that he can care for you for eternity, so that you will be with him. Yes, he does love and care for you. And we see that best in Christ on the cross. And as unlikely as it may seem, as crazy as it sounds to our human mind, the fact remains, God does forgive you. And he doesn't forgive you because your sins are small. They aren't. Our sins are serious. Our sins are grievous and ugly and nasty. And they multiply every single day. But thankfully, our forgiveness is not dependent on us. It's not dependent on our works. It's not dependent on us not screwing up a certain number of times. It has nothing to do with us, but it is for us. Because our forgiveness rests solely on the cross of Christ and what he has done. When you doubt your forgiveness, don't look into your life. Look to Jesus and what he has done for you. Look and see that the cross is full and it's not you. It's Christ freeing you from those sins. Now, Abraham already believed on his way up Mount Moriah. And the Lord provided a ram to be sacrificed in place of his son Isaac. And on the mountain of Calvary, the Lord provided, but he provided his own son. Not because you or I already believed, but so that we would believe his promises to us and gladly receive the love and forgiveness he has for us here. As Christians, we still doubt, don't we? And the devil is always trying to He's always trying to cause us to doubt God's promises, to doubt God's words for us. But the Lord has provided. He has provided his son crucified for sinners like you and I. So brothers and sisters in Christ, when you start to doubt God's love and care, lift your eyes from your surroundings and lift them to the cross where you see the great love the Father has for you. See how precious you are to him that he didn't even spare his own son to save and claim you. When you start to doubt your salvation, when you start to doubt that God could forgive a continuous sinner like you, Lift your eyes away from your sin and your mess. 
Put your eyes where your forgiveness is. Look up to the cross. Yes, see the seriousness of your sins. That it required a death, the death of God himself to atone for them. But look there. Jesus is hanging on the cross doing just that, atoning for you. You are forgiven. You are free. Because the Lord has provided. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, and especially for those who are coming to us here in Romania and in other parts of the world, fleeing war in Ukraine, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the, the morning prayer, and then afterwards I will pray the evening prayer. If uh, We will just pray the evening. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.